Here in the fourth video, we're going to put things together. And by that, I mean we're going to take atoms and now put them together so we can begin bonding and forming compounds. And in this video, we're going to talk about ionic compounds. And we're just going to go into the true basics. We'll go into more detail in section eight. And for all chemical bonding, we're either trading or sharing electrons. When we trade, we're dealing with ionic bonding. When we share, we're dealing with a covalent bonding. And as I said, this video is going to be on ionic bonding. And in ionic bonding, electrons are transferred from one atom to another. This means that you get oppositely charged particles formed. And electrons have to go from one atom to another. They can't exist on their own. The one that loses electrons becomes positively charged and is called a cation. The atom that gains electrons is negatively charged and it is called an anion. Metals can only bond ionically, and they always form cations. Nonmetals can bond ionically or covalently, but when they bond ionically, they will always form anions. So why does ionic bonding occur? Well, simply because opposites attract. Take a sodium atom and a chlorine atom. Sodium from the first representative group has one valence electron. Chlorine from the seventh representative group has seven valence electrons. In order to reach the octet, the sodium atom will lose its valence electron and will be transferred over to the chlorine atom. And so now you'll have a sodium ion because it has lost one electron, a chloride ion, it has gained. Both are in their octet state now. Opposites attract, and so they are drawn towards each other, and we say we have sodium chloride. Now, the total electrical charge for any compound must be zero. This is true whether it's ionic or covalent. But for ionic compounds, the total positive charge present must equal the total negative charge. So let's take a look about at magnesium and chlorine. Magnesium in the second representative column has two valence electrons. And as we just showed, chlorine has seven. So if you take a magnesium and a chlorine, the magnesium can take lose one electron, and the chlorine can gain one. And so now you would have magnesium one plus and chlorine one minus. The chlorine's in its octet state, but the magnesium still isn't. So bring in another chlorine atom. The magnesium can now transfer its remaining valence electron to the new chlorine atom. You now have a total of three ions of magnesium two plus and two chlorine one minuses. They're all in their octet state. They attract each other, and we have one magnesium and two chlorines, and that would be written as MgCl sub two, or magnesium chloride. Now what's interesting is ionic compounds do not form molecules. What they do is form a continuous array of ions because actually the attractive forces of each of the charges is in a 360 direction. So it's an ionic compound looks more like this. This is sodium chloride, with each of the sodiums being attracted to the chlorines, each of the chlorines being attracted to the sodium, but the ratio is one to one. So the entity that you may think of as a molecule of sodium chloride is really technically a formula unit, which is simply the lowest whole number ratio of ions in the substance. But I'll be honest, if you call it a molecule of sodium chloride, I'm not going to get upset. And so, for example, you've got one magnesium and two chlorines, and so you get magnesium chloride. This is a formula unit, but as I said, if you call it a molecule, no big deal. Now, what are the properties of ionic compounds? They are crystalline solids at room temperature. This happens to be sodium fluoride, nice purple crystals. Because the opposite attracting, the electrostatic attraction is very strong, ionic compounds tend to have high melting and boiling points. For example, table salt melts at 801 degrees Celsius. Remember, that's eight times the boiling point of water. And it boils at 1,413 degrees Celsius, or 14 times the boiling point of water. When dissolved in water, ionic compounds will ionize. What that means is they will break into their ions. This allows an electrical current to pass through the water. Water itself is a lousy conductor of electricity, but mix an ionic compound in with it, and it becomes a good conductor of electricity. And this is why ionic compounds are frequently called electrolytes, and these are the same electrolytes 
that Gatorade tries to peddle you uh, when they try to sell you their product. And this ionization is sometimes called dissociation. And what happens is, is the tight-packed solid ions get surrounded by the water and separated. And so you can see that the charged particles can move around, and that would allow for the conduction of electricity. Ionic compounds will also conduct electricity in the molten state when they're melted, but they won't do it when they are solid. So to review ionic compounds and ionic bonding at the true basics, ionic compounds must be made up of anions and cations. The metals will always be cations. Nonmetals, when they bond ionically, remember they may bond covalently, are always anions. The total positive charge within the formula unit must equal the total negative charge in the formula unit. It's not a true molecule. It's technically that formula unit. Forms an array of ions, makes crystalline solids, which have high melting and boiling points. They don't conduct electricity when solid, but ionic compounds will conduct electricity when they are liquid or molten. And when dissolved in water to make what's called an aqueous solution, they will conduct electricity, which is why ionic compounds are frequently called electrolytes. So that does it for the basics of ionic bonding. We'll go into the basics of covalent bonding with the next video.